Hello, hello, and welcome to a very special episode of the State of the Fandom Podcast. I am your furry president for life, democratically elected, of course. And with me, as always, is... Hello, this is your vice president, Link Labrador. And today is a very special day. We are talking about China and how the global economy functions. Absolutely. So At a first grade level. A first grade level? Well, you provide the first grade level analysis. I'll provide <laughs> the 13th grade level analysis. Um, so what specific topic in regards to China would you like to start with? We got a lot to choose from. We got the recent COVID lockdowns, supply chain issues, um, the protests being suppressed. Uh, what would you like to start? Well, we can start with the protests being suppressed. And they're now chanting, give me freedom or give me death. This is China. Wow. Yes. I, I, wow. This is, <laughs> this is not something I ever expected to see in my lifetime. Um, it is wild that in a country that has such a controlled media, mm -hmm. uh, such a controlled internet, yes. that they would be looking to our founding fathers for advice, which is great. Um, you know, I, I hope that uh, the, <laughs> the people of China are able to succeed in their endeavors. Well, at the end of the day, they either succeed or die. They have nothing to lose at this point. I will send you to Jesus. That's <laughs> Xi Jinping, by the way. <laughs> I will send you to Jesus. <laughs> well, as um, Zelensky says, uh, you reach a point where violence is the only avenue forward. Mm. Conversation with a, dicta a dictatorial government doesn't exist. Wow. Uh, now, why is that? Why? Um, because in an ideal world, every citizen of any country would be able to go to their government and air their grievances. Well, China isn't an ideal world. It's an right. idealized world of do what I say, no, do what I say, no, I, just do what I say, otherwise you die. Right. Well, <laughs> and, and, and the thing that is incredible to me is that this is the way that it has been for I don't even know how long, a hundred years or more. And yet the human spirit is so strong that they can fight back against this oppression, even under these circumstances. Well, take the United States during the uh, Revolutionary War. Mm -hmm. Take the United States during the War of Succession. Right. Uh, the human spirit is indomitable. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I only wish that, uh, like in the American Revolutionary War, only, you know, what was it, around 10,000 soldiers died or something like that? If only that were the case with China uh, freeing itself from the Chinese Communist Party. Well, but... in that regard, uh, the Revolutionary War and the War of China is scaled comparative. The scale is still comparable. Hmm. Because you had a you had lesser population base to work with for the Revolutionary War, you have more population base, but I'd be willing to bet the end results are still going to be apples to apples compar comparison of hmm. people lost over freedoms gained. I certainly hope so because um, they're not going to start nuking themselves to put down revolution. Hopefully. Let's certainly hope that is the case. <laughs> uh, I can't guarantee it, but let's 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 hope that that is the case. And after all, as uh, as Liberty Prime would say, "Communists detected on American soil. Lethal force engaged." <laughs> that line. <laughs> Death is a preferable alternative to communism. There, there is the one that I was looking for. <laughs> Death is a preferable alternative to communism. Yes. <laughs> well, on the topic of communism itself, communism, communism itself is not inherently evil. Correct. 
No ism is inherently evil. It's a balancing act. National like, socialism? Taken to the extremes, everything is evil. Yes. I'm just joking. I'm just joking. Uh, but yeah, it's the... Um, to, to put it another way, the, the extremes of any ideology are detrimental to the ideology itself and to society as a whole. Yes. You know, um, the idea of, you know, uh, oh, let's let's create a dictatorship and uh, give all the power to them. And then eventually we won't need them anymore and we'll have a communist utopia. Well, unsurprisingly, the people in power don't want to give up their power. No. Give up power? <clears throat> well, and it comes back to the the um, guidelines in Rules for Rulers where... Mm -hmm. Um, the the people who tried to make communism, uh, tried to make a communist utopia work in Russia, China, etc. <laughs> Unfortunately, uh, they did not use the principles from Rules for Rulers of distribute the power uh, where you are you are accountable to many many people. Uh, if you're only accountable to, you know, a couple dozen members of the top of the Kremlin, then all you have to do is keep them happy and you'll retain your power. Uh-huh. Um, you know, democracy is not some kind of magic solution. It's just the people in a democracy who are in power are, uh, they have to, to retain their power, they have to be accountable to the people. Now, unfortunately, <laughs> unfortunately... We have, um, you know, many, many people in the, uh, in the current political system who are avoiding the responsibility they have to be accountable to the people. Well, that's the thing. At some point, the, at some point, the system breaks down. <clears throat> Mission failed. We'll get them next time. Yes! <laughs> Mushal Farrell! <laughs> well, that's the thing. You wind up with a failed state when the people at the very top are no longer accountable to anyone but the people around themselves. Right. It's one of the failings that we have in the United States right now is we need a radical shift in accountability and responsibility, yes. which everyone's arguing about this... This law, and that law, this law, that law. What about policy? Well, Let's look at that is what policy is. Policy is laws and regulation. Yes. But we're fu we're fussing about the wrong issues. Interesting. Okay. As a whole. I completely Is the right is the right <laughs> to uh, housing part of the debate right now? <laughs> no. Not even close. Uh, the other question is, how the hell are we going to power 300 million new electric cars. How is that going to work? Uh, the people in charge are forcing the people to buy electric cars in the future. You know, oh, 2035, they'll only be able to buy an electric car. But they have no plan, none, to be able to provide enough electricity with renewable sources so that we can meet the uh the climate targets of less than two degrees warming uh they they don't have a solution well is it worth going bank is it worth bankrupting the country and bankrupting the fucking world to change the climate by two fucking degrees uh, at that point yes and let me tell you why so <clears throat> uh this is this is something that a lot of people don't understand and it, you may or may not have heard this argument before so let me know if you have uh so when they say a global target of two degrees that is for the entire globe that includes the oceans that includes the polar caps etc mm -hmm. the temperature on land fluctuates by a large amount you know it could be you know negative 20 in the northern areas in the winter and it could be positive 120 in arkansas or florida or mexico or whatever in the summer yeah so uh because the temperature fluctuates more on land a two degree difference in total 
would have a much bigger effect on land areas. And in particular, unfortunately, it would have a uh, particularly strong effect on poor areas of the world. So just as a simple example, there are hundreds of millions of people who live in sub-Saharan Africa. And as right now, the African desert, the Sahara desert is growing in size. And so many, many, many millions of people will suffer if, um, if we don't stop the warming from happening so that the desert continues to grow in size. Well, I mean, imagine, imagine the difference between living in a grassland versus living in a desert. Like that's, that's a pretty big difference. Well, that's the thing. As stewards of this planet, we need to all be responsible. Mm-hmm. But responsibility, not just for our neighbors, not just for the people down the street, but we have to do what's right for our nation and our country. Absolutely. If China keeps wanting to fuck up the world, how the hell are we going to compete with China? Right, right. We can't. Okay. Plain and simple. Hold with on. The, well, let me finish. Okay. We can't compete with China right now due to our own lack of vision, due to our own lack of understanding, due to individuals buying for power over wishes and, and promising. Oh, I promise that we'll make sure everyone has an electric car. How the fuck are we how are we going to make sure that happens? Short answer, they don't have an answer. Long answer, they don't fucking care. They'd Correct. rather bankrupt the country, bankrupt the world for their own goddamn for their own goddamn political influence and political power. That's why we should Stand up to these idiots. Stand up to these fuckers and say, no more. Without a plan, we're not following your fucking asses off a cliff. We're no longer sheep. Right. If we bankrupt the country, guess what? They have no power, but they still have power. They have all the guns. They have all the military. Until the military turns on them. Right. Then what do we have? A military dictatorship. Uh, something that I find just absolutely fascinating because the idea of a country with four times as many people as the United States is just wild. Like, there's a lot of people in America. There's four times as many in China. Uh huh. And uh, something that I, I, it's a statistic I read a few years ago now, but you know they were they were talking about the protests in Hong Kong with like, you know, oh, there's two million people on the streets. That's amazing. Two million people um, on the streets. For Hong Kong, is about 10,000 people here in the United States no, protesting. No no. no, no, no. That's not true because Hong Kong has a population of 8 million. So that's one in four. Oh, okay. So imagine, imagine, you know, in a town of... City of Detroit basically rioting. Sure. Imagine, um, you know, in the city of Detroit, a city with, I think, about a million people, it'd be 250,000. So yes, that's a big protest. Yes. But the statistic that I found fascinating is... Uh, two million is approximately the number of police officers in China. So they could literally have one police officer for every protester. Yes. Just wild. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's the thing. Uh, getting back to the climate issue, yes, it is a problem. Yes, this. Yes, that. One, we don't have enough supply chain to support 300 converting every single one of our cars to electric. That supply chain does not exist. That is a pipe dream. Here's how you you would have to do it. You would have to turn every single goddamn town and every single goddamn neighborhood into its own fucking power bank Mm -hmm. for you to even come close, close to uh, this idea. It'd be cheaper and easier to reinforce the entirety of the electrical grid. Well, that will have to be done. Uh, let, let me add to your point, okay? Yep. So, obviously, uh, oh, for, any, for anyone who's, uh, who's not heard some of our previous shows, um, so the reason why we're talking about uh, electrification of cars is because uh, California has passed a law that says after 2035, no uh, internal combustion engines will be able to be sold in the state for like regular cars. Obviously those will be like farm equipment and stuff, but other than that, other than special cases, you won't won't be able 
to buy a car that is not an electric car. Well, in that case, our next car is going to be diesel. <laughs> what ne- is going to never going to run out of fry oil, <laughs> uh, guys? If we honestly want to replace the elect- uh, the combustion engine, why don't we invest? It'd be cheaper to invest money, energy, and resources into the diesel electric cars, mm-hmm. and that technology could be improved immensely. Oh, sure. It would be cheaper on everyone. It would be cheaper on the planet. By the way, the planet's debating about rebelling at this point. I swear, good God, Mother Earth, please don't fucking end me. I'm trying to help. Right? (laughs) We're trying at the very least. That's true. Um, So, here, to, to add to your earlier point, here's what needs to be done if California is going to uh switch completely over to electric cars and ideally uh this would be done over the entire country um because uh if we have a hardened electrical grid Mm -hmm. local power generation yep clean power generation and when i mean clean i mean specifically non-polluting so you can argue you know i'm sure many of the listeners on our on our radio show are going to be like i don't care about climate change uh that's fine what i bet you do care about is pollution lung cancer kids dying of lung disease that is important to everyone i don't know anybody who'd be like yeah more kids should die of lung cancer uh well what on that topic what is the statistical rate of getting lung cancer here in the united states over China, which pretty much need a gas mask anyway. Otherwise, you're just smoking a pack of cigarettes every single day without smoking a pack of cigarettes. Right. So uh, I would have to look up the uh, the exact numbers, mm-hmm. but like uh, a doctor who specializes in lung medicine, um, they can. I don't remember what it's called, but anyway. Uh, they can actually tell just by looking at a tissue sample if the person has lived in a city or lived in the country because the person who lived in the country, their lungs are so much cleaner. Yeah. Like, there's a reason why when people go out to the country, they're like, oh, the air smells so fresh. Like, that's not just psychosomatic. That's, <laughs> that's, that's your brain saying, oh, my God, I can actually breathe. Like, uh, yeah. the, um, the, the... Also, to answer your question in a different way, uh, it, everything is relative. You know, it, it, I would far rather live in Los Angeles than Mumbai, despite the fact that Los Angeles is still one of the most polluted cities in the U.S. Uh, it's a tenth or a hundredth the pollution of a place like Shanghai or Mumbai. <laughs> well, yes, and I would refuse to live in uh, New York at this point. Have you seen what's going on in New York? It's, Tell me. Well, you got trash everywhere. Literal trash just building up on the streets. Jesus. Oh, there was a big um, uh, waste management strike, wasn't there? I think so. I, I haven't read up on that, but yeah. Yeah. Everyone's striking. Everyone's getting fed up with these systems that are in place that only exist to benefit those at the very top because those at the very top don't care about the people below them. Right. It's obvious they don't care. It's obvious that we shouldn't give a shit about them. Mm. Strike more people. Rise up. Be mad as hell. And See, don't take it anymore. Absolutely. I. Uh, this is something that I find absolutely fascinating. Like, why are there not more labor strikes? Why are there not more housing strikes? Uh, this is something that Alinsky talked about a lot in, in, uh, in his book that I'd, I'd never even heard of a housing strike before I read um, Rules for Radicals. So uh, a housing strike, for anybody who doesn't know, is um, everybody in a rental building... Refuses to pay rent. Refuses to pay rent at the same time. Yep. And then you have a representative or a council or something like that that then the owner negotiates with. So you don't just do it haphazardly. You have a specific set of demands Yep. and a specific person for the owner to go and talk to. Well, that's the thing. This type of conversation is not taught in school. No. No, it is not. not. 
School does not teach you how to rise up against the establishment <laughs> for the better. What? Really? I'm so shocked. That College does not teach you this stuff any either. College what? teach you, oh, you have to be angry about genders. You have to be angry about, I'm triggered. How about you be angry about the state of the fucking union? How about you right. ask questions? Stand up for yourself. Educate yourself. Well, and to be fair, to be fair, to any of our listeners who, you know, have a uh, non-standard gender, uh, we're not attacking those people. We're just saying that there are important issues in the world that are not being addressed at all. Correct. There, there are hundreds of thousands, hundreds of thousands of homeless people in the United States. That is criminal, in my opinion. That, uh-huh. that, that, is, that is unconscionable. That we would have a country with, you know, billionaires, a country with, um, you know, uh, 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 just one company, Walmart, makes $500 billion a year. And yet, every time I go to Walmart, there's some homeless bum in the parking lot. Like, uh uh-huh, that should be illegal. That should be wrong that... Uh, not not that the person should be illegal, but it, it should be illegal for um, uh, people to not get the help that they need. Yeah. Now, granted, you're always going to have those weird nomadic weird those nomadic individuals saying, "Nope, I'm tired of this shit. I'm just going to go hop on my horse, grab my lean tube. See you later, world. Bye." <laughs> Right, and um, <laughs> there uh, in uh, places like Finland and Sweden, there are people who are homeless by choice. Yeah. But there are no homeless people that are not by choice. Um, the the uh, the and I I mean I saw this myself when I went to the UK and Germany. You didn't see homeless people, no matter how big the city, no matter how you know. Uh, no matter how small the city, everyone who needed a place to sleep had a place to sleep. Yes. Uh, and the city was very calm and nice as a result. There wasn't trash everywhere. There weren't people, you know, begging you for money or whatever. Like, it makes the experience for tourism better. Well, that's the thing. And These... it makes the experience for the individual much better. Well, that's the thing. The vast majority of these cities have been around several millennia longer than here in the United States. (laughs) So they've had time to figure this shit out. Mm -hmm. Right. So to get back to our, uh, our topic of China and the supply chain. Yes. Here is what I think needs to happen. Okay? Yeah. Because... How, how did you put it? You said something like, we can't currently compete with China. No, we just can't. So, uh, we've we've talked about some of the solutions that we have. Yep. But what are, what are some of the obstacles? So, like, if, if there was going to be some type of big campaign today, yep. what would be some of the obstacles that would keep it from happening? Well, here's why we can't... To put your question another way, here's why we can't compete with China. Mm-hmm. One, our corporations like to bow down to China. True. Two, the country's morality doesn't exist. We're all busy fighting each other over nothing. Mm -hmm. Three, we do not have a 10-year plan. Mm -hmm. We just want to, oh, we're worried about China and them taking over Taiwan and taking all the... um, taking over the manufacturing plants in Taiwan. What are we going to do about it? Well, we're going to put it in a plant in Ohio and we're going to invest billions of dollars. Mm-hmm. Why didn't we do that 10 fucking years ago? Right. <laughs> well, the the reason why uh, there is so little forward thinking in the United States and so much forward thinking in China is because, as we've discussed before, China has these five-year plans, 10-year plans, 100-year plans. Uh Uh-huh. They are consciously thinking about, you know, what will we need in 100 years? In the year, you know, 2122, what are we going to need? Oh, 
Highways in Africa, very helpful to us in terms of economic growth over the next hundred years. So why not invest 10 billion or whatever it is to uh-huh. update the roads in these places where we now have, we being China in this case, yep. have factories to produce stuff for the Chinese market. It's, it's very funny. You have China is the manufacturer for a lot of other countries and then Africa and Bangladesh are now becoming the manufacturers for the Chinese market. Yeah. Well, uh, we have gone for close to 30 minutes, so let's take a quick ad break and we will be right back. Yep. Hello, my friends. Are you in need of some software to help you run your pirate crew? Perhaps you are drop shipping or you are running a team of software developers and having trouble figuring out how to make everything run smoothly. Well, you can try our sponsor, Monday.com. Yes, Monday.com, where we go for all of our needs. Yes, all of our needs. Uh, You can check the episode description for a link that will uh, take you to Monday.com where you can learn about what they do. Uh, Basically, it is a way to organize all the different parts of your business, including things like software development, marketing, uh, sales, and human resources. Uh, They've been used by places like HubSpot, the NHL, and Hulu. How exciting. Well, I've tried other... I've tried other software before. What makes this one different? Uh, What makes it different is that it is built from the ground up to be simple and to fit the exact needs of a small business. So as somebody who's run a small business for a long time, oftentimes you'll have a solution that is either for a business that is smaller than yours with one person or bigger than yours with 100 people. Uh, You know, a a solution that is for 100 people it's not going to work very well for a small business. So uh, if you are interested in uh, checking it out, you can go to monday.com and make sure to use the referral link in our episode description. Hello, hello, friends. and Welcome back to the show. Uh, hopefully you enjoyed that little ad break and you uh, purchased all of the mattresses or whatever we were shilling in the previous segment. Yes. <laughs> so... This next segment is about... Well, we were talking about um, uh, specifically why the U.S. has trouble competing with China. Yes. And so uh, we, uh, what we were just talking about before we had our ad break was that um, uh, China has a far forward thinking way of running their government and the U.S. does not. So what are your thoughts on that? So... Here's my thoughts on the United States and what we can improve upon far thinking. Mm -hmm. We went to the moon in 10 years. Our uh, president at the time, what was that, Reagan, said that we were going to the moon. Reagan? Reagan? John F. Kennedy. John F. Kennedy. My bad. (laughs) 20 years difference, my dear. Fine. Well, John F. Kennedy said that we were going to go to the moon, and he made it happen. Mm Mm-hmm. He also spent 20% of the federal budget on the moon program, on the Apollo program. Well, here's my thing. Mm -hmm. Cost isn't an object when you are going to be the best. Right. If you want to become the best, just, if you want to be the best, don't worry about the cost. Mm. Interesting. Because there's a principle in business. You can either have it cheap, you can have it good, or you can have it fast. Right. If you want it good and fast, it's going to be cheap. If you want it, if you want it good and fast, it's not going to be cheap. Good, to say. yeah. If you want it good and fast, it's not going to be cheap. Right. If it's going to be cheap and fast. It's not going to be good. Right. And so uh, here, here is how I think that the U.S. can um, better compete with China. So one of the uh, policy proposals that I have for when we run for the presidency is a new department, okay? A new new federal uh, department called the Federal Department of the Far Distant Future, (laughs) FDFDF, just because it's funny. But uh, we can't just call it RTD2. Oh my God. Call it alphabet soup if you want. Um, but 
our new department, the alphabet soup. Right. Because there are some departments that have the ability to look a you know, hundred years into the future. But uh, from what I understand, we don't really have, at the very least, we don't have any well-funded agencies that are specifically preparing for the far future. So, we, and when I say far future, I don't necessarily mean a hundred years. I mean a thousand or 10,000 years in the future. Yes. Now, to, just to scale it back just a little bit, mm -hmm. policies that we can enact today that our president could do today. Hey, Biden, here's a free one. Absolutely free. Um, spend about $10 million and harden the United States electrical grid against all foreign enemies, against all enemies, foreign and domestic, and or the sun itself. Right. Because it was... A terrorist attack just happened, where was that? Uh, North Carolina. North Carolina, and apparently your AR-15, or whatever they use, has the power to bring down the electrical grid. Jesus. <laughs> I'm sorry, uh, what? Yeah, that's not okay. Uh, they, they <laughs> actually, you were saying they were talking about this on um, Coast to Coast. Yes. Uh, how vulnerable the electrical grid is. They've been talking about this specifically on Coast to Coast for the last 10 years. That's wow. where I originally got the idea. That's where I learned it from was mm -hmm. just how vulnerable the electrical grid is and looking into it and looking at, looking at on the side of the highway, you see all these transformers. You see all these substations. Mm -hmm. They have a chain link fence around it. Right. We can't put a concrete wall around it at the very least. Well, uh, things like that are expensive. Security in particular is very expensive. Okay. Security in a rural area is even more expensive. Here's the thing. What is the cost of civilization itself? <laughs> uh, interesting question. So uh, this gets into a... Um, a, an idea of an existential risk. Do you know what that means? Yes, I do. Okay, so for any of our listeners who don't know, uh, an existential risk means a risk to human life or society in general. Because, uh -huh. you know, it, you could have a collapse of civilization and people would still be alive, but there's not going to be that many people. Exactly. Um, you yeah. know, th there, there were not that many people in the world when everyone was a hunter-gatherer. Uh huh. Or it was the 1880s or 1890s when we had a huge solar flare that wiped out the electric grid. Yeah, and and keep in mind that this was long before electrification in most cities. So yeah. the primary um, uh, the primary uh, infrastructure that was affected by this solar flare in the mid 1800s was telegraph. Uh huh. And even then, it did in modern terms, you know, millions and millions of dollars in damage to the telegraph grid, and it had to be rebuilt over a period of, I don't know how many years. Uh, and the idea, let's just paint a picture for the viewers, okay? Uh-huh. Imagine you wake up one day, and your house has no electricity. You try to turn on your phone. It doesn't turn on. You try to turn on your computer. It doesn't turn on. You walk out to your car that is now mostly controlled by computers. And it doesn't start. Uh-huh. So, so imagine how quickly society would collapse if you had no power, no refrigeration, no transportation. Uh, yeah, that would be really bad. Meanwhile, we're spending, uh, correction, we're misplacing billions, if not trillions of dollars worth of military assets every year. Don't ask me how the, don't ask me how the U.S. military manages to fail six audits of their equipment or something. A recent, wow. recent auditing reports have just come out for the U.S. military. Hmm. Apparently they've lost an ungodly amount of equipment somehow. What is, the, what is the price of securing civilization itself? Correction, it doesn't matter what the price tag is, just do it. Right. It's expensive. I don't care. Make a bond for it. 
I, I don't care what you have to do to get it done. It does not matter at that point. Mm-hmm. Well, and, and this brings us to uh, one of our other big policy initiatives, which is paying for everything that we want to do. Uh-huh. Uh, yes, something like our plan for revitalizing the Rust Belt and bringing manufacturing back to these rural areas in America, mm-hmm. that's going to be very expensive. It's going to cost tens of billions. So but, what? but, but, we give the American people the ability Mm -hmm. to revitalize their own community with a bond. Yes. Okay. So uh, again, for anybody in the audience who doesn't know, uh, a bond issued by a state or a county or a city, for example, uh, this is essentially just a a loan. Okay. So Uh you go to your town and you say, hey, you know, town of Columbus, Ohio. We want to take these five factories that closed down in 1980, and we want to make them back into manufacturing centers and employ 10,000 people from the city. Yep. Or another one, take an old lumber mill from Maine. Sure. If it's shut down, retool it. Mm -hmm. There's a lumber mill in one of my my old town of um, Yarmouth Mm -hmm. or wherever. Most of it's closed. Right. Well, what are they doing with it? Nothing. Right. They had a, um, some of the other towns that I had, uh, some of the other towns up in Maine. Mm-hmm. They um, are now revitalized with shopping centers. They're revitalized with music centers. They're, right. Maine is a very is a very tourist town. Yeah, it's very tourist and very tourist oriented for sure. Yes, uh, and not every state is going to have that advantage, unfortunately. But the vast majority of the poorest states in the country have these manufacturing centers that are no longer being used, or they just have you know warehouses and buildings and all of this that uh, you know they were very useful in the sixties, seventies, eighties. But then when manufacturing all moved to Southeast Asia there's no use for them anymore or they're being used for, you know, an Amazon warehouse or whatever. Yeah. Um, Speaking of Amazon, they're actually laying off a lot of their employees. That's true. Uh, Do you know one of the largest segments of the employees that they're laying off? Warehouse workers? They're laying off their support staff because as Amazon and several other countries are wont to do, uh, what they did was they hired... Uh, I don't know exactly how many, but several thousand people to go out and recruit workers, okay? Mm-hmm. And then they took all of that data from, you know, these people working for Amazon for 10 years, and they created an automated system to do their job. That makes sense. So now yeah. Amazon's hiring practices are even more robotic and uh, controlled by algorithm. Oh, of course. So if you want to get... So if you want to get hired by Amazon, just use a robot to write your resume that uses their algorithms and their language, and you'll get hired no problem. Well, yeah, it's it's not difficult to get a job at Amazon. It's just very difficult. It's very tough on your body because you're running around a giant warehouse. (laughs) Yeah. Um, And unfortunately... Uh, Amazon is uh, facing a huge labor shortage. And instead of improving the conditions of their labor force, they're just saying, well, you know, we'll just make it all robots instead. I it's, mean, it's very sad. I mean, Amazon is no different than the Rockefellers of the day. Mm-hmm. No different. Right. Hell, the Rockefellers, what made them, you know, so powerful was they owned the supply chain. Basically, they owned everything down to the farm that the farmer tilled his field and got the corn from. Mm -hmm. Well, and this is uh, an aspect that Amazon is using to great effect of... um, So here's what they do, okay? Yep. Uh, Let's say somebody like you and I starts selling a specific product on Amazon. So let's say we start selling a uh, desk chair. Yep. 
Now this, for whatever reason, this is a new type of desk chair, different to what Amazon sells uh, already. Already, right. This one gives back massages and... Sucks your dick, sure. And, uh, uh, radio, uh, radio. Oh, right. Uh, sucks your weenus, yes. No. It's a joke, it's a joke. Uh, so, anyway. Um, the uh, What Amazon will do is they have an internal algorithm and staff to analyze lots of different products. And if a product does really well on Amazon, they will make their own generic version of that product. So, you know, all these Amazon basics products that you see now of, you know, USB cords or batteries or whatever, there used to be people on Amazon doing really well selling, you know, their own brand of batteries. But now Amazon is like 90% of the market. Yeah, because Amazon just takes over and goes, oh, we can do that for cheaper and easier because we have all the money and all the power. Mm-hmm. Instead of 30%, which we get from our sellers, we get 100%. Let's get 100%. Right. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. Amazon is a monopoly on the economy. Well, and not only that, but Amazon and many other companies, uh, one of the ways that they make money is by abusing the systems that are in place. So, yes. So, for example, you will never see an Amazon van out in the middle of nowhere, West Virginia. Uh huh. Do you know? Do you know? Do you know what they use to deliver Amazon packages out in the middle of nowhere? I would assume they just have a... The U.S. Postal Service! (laughs) Oh, I was going to say something even more esoteric, like uh, Uber or something. (laughs) There's not Ubers out in the middle of nowhere. I would know. Um, But uh, (laughs) the... um, the, it's 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 fascinating to me because you know the the postal service runs at a loss in these areas, so they 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 know that they're not going to make enough money to cover their costs in Anchorage, Alaska, but the money that they make in Dallas, where they make more money than they take than they spend, covers the costs of where they're losing money, which balances the sheets. Did you know the U.S. Postal Service can't make a profit and they can't lose a dollar somehow? That's correct. Well, they, they have to adjust their cost and their, um, you know, cost of postage, number of employees, whatever. They have to adjust it so that they don't make a profit. Why don't they just make it a nonprofit and call it a day? I mean, that's essentially what it is. I, mean, I, I don't know exactly the term for it, but it's essentially a government nonprofit. It, it is... Yeah, I'm pretty sure even the U.S. military manages to make a profit. Oh, God, no. <laughs> uh, the U.S. government, uh, sorry, the U.S. military is basically just a giant hole, a, a, a money pit, and you're just <laughs> shoveling money into a pit. Um, the onion skit, right? I really <laughs> I love that skit. Why sh- uh, we should close the money pit. My father had a job shoveling money into the money pit. <laughs> Why don't we just throw immigrants into the money? <laughs> so I love the onion. I, by the way, the onion, the rest of the world, it's not a to-do list. No! Stop trying, nor is 1984 a to-do list. Jesus. So, uh, one, of the, one of the things that I wanted to make sure that we emphasize to the viewers is some of our plans on how to fix these problems. Yes. So, we, we've, in my opinion, One of the biggest problems in the country right now is people who point out the problems, Mm -hmm. especially in the news media. Uh, And and to be fair, let me be very clear, left, right, and center, they point out the problems and they either don't provide a solution or they provide a solution that's so absurd that, you know, uh, that will never happen. Or they blame the other guy for not doing something and they're busy bickering like children at a preschool or a high school and last i checked the president's job is to be uh what's the right word um the one mediating all of this the one who's supposed to um hmm, what's a polite way of putting 
the president of a company's job, the president of the United States, is supposed to be the one who, uh, you know, keeps them all into shape. Yes! Yeah, well, and um, (laughs) ideally, uh, so there's a couple of different people that have similar tasks. So you have the House Majority Leader, you have the Senate Majority Leader, and then in both the House and the Senate, you have what's called the Majority Whip. Yes. And the Majority Whip whips them into shape. So the the Majority Whip goes around and collects votes for whatever... um, policy that it is. So, you know, the, uh, the the person who's in charge of the House, the House Majority Leader, you know, formerly Nancy Pelosi, for example, uh, she might go out and say, you know, we're going to do uh, a new national holiday for National Chocolate Day. A National then, Protect Kittens Day. It's sure. National Whatever Day. There's, right. there's 365 national days in the year. <laughs> right. If uh, not more at this point, and right, I, I'm just, <laughs> just giving an example. And then the House Majority Whip will go and talk to the different people and say, you know, yeah, we need to make sure you're going to vote for this. You know, we, we want this to succeed. Um, and you know, maybe in the case of like a spending bill, they might have to give, you know, oh well, my constituents don't like this, so you know, we'll give you this special break so that you'll vote for it. You know, these kinds of things. Exactly. And so uh, the president also does some of these tasks as well, but it's not his primary duty, his or her, I should say. His so far. (laughs) The her hasn't happened yet. It should happen at some point. Well, we'll have have a a charismatic um, female politician come along who uh, bulldozes the competition. Just this hasn't happened yet. Uh, so, like I said, one of the biggest problems is people pointing out the problems and not actually having any way to solve them. So, step one, in yep. my opinion, uh, or uh, not even in my opinion, this is, this is uh, my policy proposal, like I said. And I encourage our listeners to reach out to us and critique it, because I want it, uh, I, I am always open to constructive criticism. I'm always looking to improve my ideas so that when we do have power, when we do have um, the ability to put it into action, that it goes as smoothly as possible. I have an idea. What if we take some of our policy proposal ideas and go to some of the Reddit boards that talk about politics? Sure. And just have them rip it apart. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure they would. I'm sure they would. Uh, that's a good idea. Uh, in fact, uh, we should, um, when we do an episode like this, where we're talking about a policy proposal, we should, uh, we should post the episode on there and see what they think. Yeah. Or the episode transcript, for example. Yeah. Uh, that's a good idea. So, step one for, um, uh, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll, uh, we're talking specifically today about China and the supply chain. So we'll, yes. Uh, we'll take electric cars as our example. Yep. But this applies to lots of different products. So um, uh, California, the UK, and several other countries have made these targets for we're only going to sell uh, electric cars by the year 2035, or sometimes it's 2040, uh, around these, these time frames. My question is, the UK with the price being as, with the price of gas being as big as it is, Mm -hmm. why have they not already converted to electric? Excellent question. And the reason why is supply chain. Uh, Let's let's put it this way, okay? Obviously, electric cars are better, not just for people, but for the planet and pollution. There, 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 There is no contest because... You know, let's let's say hypothetically that you have exactly the same amount of pollution from a car as making the same amount of electricity from a power plant. The fact that the pollution is being created, you know, especially particulate pollution, so the little pieces of coal and dust in the atmosphere, the fact that that is happening out in the middle of nowhere with the power plant means that... Uh, fewer people will have issues with lung cancer and um, asthma, heart disease, etc. 
Mm -hmm. So, uh, electric cars are better in almost every way. Unless you start looking into the details. Uh huh. For example, we need more lithium batteries than have been produced in total since the beginning of the production of lithium batteries approximately 30 years ago. We need more than the total amount that have been produced in those 30 years to be able to do just electric cars for California, like not including the UK, Japan, Australia, etc. Yeah. Uh, that well, is a tall order. Are we going to strip mine the planet to save the planet? Uh, this is a topic that was covered in an excellent episode of um, the Windover Productions channel, where they were talking about the environmental cost of uh, mining for lithium. And they were like, yeah, you know, there's always trade-offs. And this is a really tough one because, you know, you could say, well, yeah, it'll help pollution. It'll help um, people have uh, uh, more independence because they can create their own electricity and use it. You know, we're not depending on foreign oil, et cetera. Uh, but in the places where lithium is mined, there is a huge issue with uh, groundwater contamination. Uh-huh. And a huge issue of uh, the local population of whatever um, uh, country or town or whatever that it's in. Yeah. Uh, a huge issue of exploitation of the local population for labor and uh, sex abuse. Uh, not, not good, not good. No, now a way around all that would be mining asteroids for lithium, but we haven't become a type one civilization yet. We're working on it, okay? <laughs> I, 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 I'm still trying to get to telling you my plan. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, for any listeners who don't know, a, a type one civilization is a civilization that uses uh, the equivalent of all of the solar energy that hits their planet. Well, um, that's a classical way of thinking of type 1 civilization. Okay, is there a new way? Well, there's several ways that you can get there. Either you can utilize all the solar energy, which means Dyson Sphere, or you have that fractional in between the two of being able to get to the star, get, get have per, uh, permanent outpost on the moon, and other planets as well. Now, now, hold on, hold on, hold on. You you have a, a, a little bit of trouble with the definition here, okay? Type 1 civilization is the equivalent of all of the solar energy. So if you're producing energy through nuclear power, for mm -hmm. example, and it's the equivalent of the solar energy, then that's still a type 1 civilization. It's the amount of energy. Now, yes. when you mentioned a Dyson Sphere, that's a type 2 civilization. A type 2 civilization is a civilization that can use the equivalent of all of the energy produced by their uh, solar system's star. Well, at that point, you're just building a Dyson Swarm that would be more efficient, and you'd be having permanent bases on the moon, and then you'd be launching the satellites from the moon to orbit around the sun. Mm -hmm. Basically. Right. Uh, but yes, uh, unfortunately, that is something that will probably not happen for several hundred years at minimum. So again, before we even run out of time, I would like to tell you my policy proposal so that we have yes. it on the podcast. Yep. Okay. So step one is to, <clears throat> oh, excuse me. Step one is to um, create this department. So the, the Federal Department of the Far Distant Future to create the plans to achieve the goals that we want to achieve. So in this case, the goal is all electric cars and to make an environment where that is feasible. Because if, you know, it, it's no good to give people electric cars and then have, you know, brownouts because oh, what are you going to do? You're not able to drive to work? Like that'd be a huge amount of economic loss. Mm hmm So... To make that happen, you need a stable electrical grid. So you have to uh, harden the electrical grid against attack. Yep. Step two, you need local energy generation and storage. So um, one of the things that you were talking about uh, earlier in the episode is uh, towns being able to produce and store their energy locally. And interestingly enough, 
Uh, there are actually several proposals that would use the batteries in the electric cars as the storage system for their neighborhood. So then that way, you, you might have to have some extra like backup batteries, but the majority of the power that's needed can be stored in the cars themselves. So for example, let's say that, um, you know, you drive to work, your car charges in the car park over the course of the day. So when you drive home, it's still relatively full. Uh, some of the energy, you know, maybe 10%, for example, might be used by the community drained out of the battery to, to you know, do heating and lighting at night, for example. And again, just one of many possibilities that are, that are uh, being worked on. Yes. Um, another aspect of it in terms of local power generation is we need to generate power without generating pollution or without generating a lot of pollution. Uh, I personally would like to see more nuclear power, um, but I don't think that will fly just with the public at large. So solar is by far the, the best option among the options that we have. Um, solar energy is actually currently the same price as other types of energy. So coal, natural gas, etc. And if we can reduce the price of solar panels and solar generation, then that would mean that solar energy will be much cheaper than other types of energy. And uh, we are getting close to our 30 minute mark for recording on the computer. So we will take a quick break. Yes. Our uh, program today is brought to you by one of our sponsors, ExpressVPN. Do you know what a VPN is? It is a virtual private network. That's right. And what can the viewers do with a virtual private network? And they can search the web. They can bypass China's Great Firewall. <laughs> I, I'm sure we have tons of listeners in China. Um, <laughs> uh, but yes, you can um, get around restrictions of your network. Like, let's say that you're on a school network yep. or a college network. Um, you can access most websites, including uh, some of the... Uh, Places that host, uh, let's just say, less than legal movies, uh, which you absolutely should not download. No, no, no. Do not do that. Um, but uh, you can also access uh, content that is not available on streaming services in the country that you're from. So, for example, there's quite a few BBC shows that are only available on Netflix in the UK. And so you can change to a UK server and uh, the program thinks that you're from the UK. Yep. And now you can watch those uh, region-restricted programs. Yes. Uh, so if you're interested in uh, getting uh, a VPN for yourself, you can visit the link in the episode description or just go to expressvpn.com. Well, listeners, thank you so much for listening to our program today. We greatly appreciate it. Uh, if you are listening to us on the web, uh, our website is furrypresident.com, yep. where you can listen to all of our previous episodes. We're getting close to 100 episodes of the show. Uh, you can also listen on iTunes. You can listen on uh, Google Podcasts. and any. Uh, we're on all your favorite podcast apps, including Spotify. Uh, just look for Furry President. You can find us on YouTube. You can find us on Discord as well. Absolutely. We have an active Discord of, at the moment. About 100 members, and we're growing strong. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, join our community and uh, be a part of the Furry President movement. Our goals are, one, to improve the quality of life for everyone in the United States, but especially our homeless our veterans, and the puppies who need homes. Uh, my my wonderful co-host is very passionate about giving homes to all the puppies. I am. Uh, <laughs> thank you very much for listening, everyone, and we hope that you will tune in next week. <laughs>